Good afternoon. Welcome to Energy in America, Think Tech Hawaii's、uh, show, and I'm a guest host. My name is Ray Tsuchiyama, filling in for the usual Jay Fadell. We have our guest today,、uh, a, a distinguished、uh, guest from Washington, D.C.,、uh, via the wonders of Skype. His name is Lucian Pagliaresi, and he's president of the Washington, D.C. based Energy Policy Research Foundation, or EPRINC. And it's a、uh, Beltway think tank on all things about energy in America and globally、uh, Asia Pacific, Europe, Middle East, South America. And、uh, we are two months of the、uh, new Trump administration. And、uh, right now, the cherry blossoms are diminished by snow in the DC area. But we have Lucian to give us continuing insights to the evolving、uh, energy policies of the new administration and、uh, things coming up. There he is. Lucian, how are things in DC? Uh, well, they're still、uh, a bit chaotic with the new administration, and the、uh, appointments are going much slower.、Uh, I believe the reason for that is because I'm pretty sure even、uh, President Trump did not expect to win, and so they didn't have the usual cadre of well vetted personnel to move quickly into the position. So, a big issue right now is the slow pace. Of appointments below the level of the cabinet office.、Right. But we have uh, uh, the EPA uh, uh, head, uh, Scott, uh, Scott Pruitt, in place,、yes. am I correct? Yes. And、uh, what has he been talking about? What, what are the topics that he's been kind of focusing on? And do you see any strategy or roadmap that、uh, the administration is embarking upon? So I think we can talk about.、Uh, You know, I think we could go up to a, like a $50,000 foot, $50, foot level. I think、okay. that, and look at the sort of、uh, basic view of the Trump administration, I think, and, and particularly some of the more eccentric strategists, you might say, that there was this belief that a combination of elites, bureaucrats, academics with too much power, Uh, the IAND, which we call the International Association of Name Droppers, the Davos attending、uh, experts, that all these people have gotten together and they have tried to protect us from all the downside risks in the world.、Okay. And when they did that, they took away all the upside potential.、Okay. I'm not saying that's true necessarily.、Um, that is a kind of theme.、Right. And that theme then works it through the energy and environmental policy. And so, for、uh, Administrator Pruitt, he's got two or three things、uh, on his agenda. One is a more deferential or critical view towards climate research, opening it up, if you like, to、uh, a broader scientific review.、Uh, second,、uh, a more hard nosed view on costs and benefits. Uh, the CAFE standards is the first one. Right, and we're going to discuss that more in detail later. later. I think a third one is a kind of,、uh, you know, regulatory reform. You know, are we operating in an environment where a very minute concern for every kind of risk is preventing us from? Doing everything from building roads to repairing bridges to building factories. Now, this is a kind of stark contrast, and the real world is somewhere in between, but this is the debate we're going to see in the coming months. So, we see、um, uh, the EPA、uh, progressing this area, and you just mentioned something the CAFE, which is.、Um, Has been around since、uh, I think the oil crisis. Am I correct?、Uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, 1973, and、oh. it's a way to uh, uh, get p-、uh, get the automakers. I mean, we tried to let、uh, force people to uh, conserve uh, gas, but it didn't happen that much. So we're trying to go to the automakers to design, make, and sell vehicles with higher uh, mileage uh, emission、right. uh, standards goals. Well, So, so, like lots of things in the government,、uh, the facts are always, co- always、uh, complicated. So, let's just start with a simple story. 
if you look at the 1968 film called Bullet, Steve McQueen, you might not be old enough to remember. Oh, I'm, I'm aware of that. <laughs> uh, Steve McQueen drove a 1968 Mustang. Right. right? GT, uh, I think about 275 horsepower, yeah. four speed. That car produced about one ton of criteria pollutants for 100,000 miles. And when I say criteria pollutants, I don't mean greenhouse gas emissions. I mean things like carbon monoxide, lead, sulfur dioxide, uh, 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 volatile organic compounds, those kinds. Of Today's Mustang, across 100,000 miles, produces about 10 pounds of criteria pollutants. So the first point to keep in mind is that the cars of today are enormously more uh, efficient and cleaner than the cars of the past. So one debate is, are we on the cost curve of the law of diminishing returns such that we are opposing very high costs with little return? I think, and we did have, when they, when they settled on this, idea of moving the fuel efficiency from 20-something uh, to 54.4 miles per gallon. Right, and that's 20, for 2025, right? 2025. 2025. Yeah. There was a agreement in 2008 that halfway through the process, we would do a mid-term review. Okay, and we're halfway through, and that's how the term midway mid mid-term review. review stands for. Right, and this midterm review would be partly based on a, a, a big study on, undertaken by the National Academy of Sciences, the Natural Resource Council. That study was issued in late 2016, and the agreement, even told to me personally, because we do a lot of research in this area, by EPA, that that agreement would allow, that, that document and all the research would allow all the stakeholders to look at it between late 2016 until a decision would be made in 2018, early on in 2018. Because much of the pathway was backloaded. Okay. So a lot of the achievement to get to the 54.1, and some, it may be a lot lesser number because of the change of the fleet, but a lot of the heavy lifting took place in the last five years. President Obama did not wait for that review to complete. He says, I've seen enough. And in a so-called midnight rule, <laughs> nine days before he left the uh, office of the presidency, he issued a final determination. So there's a huge amount of uproar now. But all the Trump administration done so far is restore the ex-ante conditions, which is we said we would have a year to do this review. I'm restoring that so all the stakeholders can look at it for the next year. Now, but going back to uh, the um, your analogy here of Steve McQueen, and I'm old enough to remember uh, even Aya Coca, who um, you know <laughs> unleashed a Mustang in '64, '65, and was a revolutionary car, and and you know yeah. and, and Chrysler became at the forefront of this new design and so forth. And my uncle Maui even had a '65 Mustang. Uh, so, so, um, so I remember that, and 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 of course mileage, uh, you know, back in the late '60s, and you know the bigger cars and so forth, um, Camaros and so forth had barely you know 15 miles per gallon. Now, now, but but I'll be a devil's advocate. I mean, we live in a world where um, the Microsofts, the Amazons, the Ebays, and Googles and so forth uh, are, are you know are the leaders in in an innovation economy. And you look at Intel, and you look at the power of computing. Uh, the, uh, the, you know, and it's like logarithmic how advances have been made in uh, computing power and so forth. And of course, there must be have been R and D for 20, 30, 40 years in in Detroit. But if Henry Ford was alive today, he would look, uh, open up a you know uh, SUV and say, "Oh wow, it's the same principle. It's, it's the same kind of engine that I've seen back in the 20s with a lot of electronics." And and you know, I, 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 there's a huge amount of electronics, a huge amount of sensors and so forth in a car, which which boosts uh, you know, uh, with all the R&D. So my question is. Uh, 
why is it so hard to really make revolutionary um, uh, steps in, in the car industry? So actually, I, that's a good question. Um, I, I do think uh, there are two issues. What do consumers want? If you actually, uh, you know, if you think about it, when EPA did its original analysis, the technical advisory review, and the fundamental analysis of the CAFE standards, they justified the incremental cost of the more expensive cars right, by the fact that consumers would save enough so that it would be worth the extra cost. Now, put aside that public finance theory does not allow you to take account of private benefits. You're supposed to just count for the external benefits and costs. Um, consumers want a certain kind of vehicle. And the kind of vehicle they want depends upon a lot of factors. The size of their family, uh, and uh, how far they plan to travel, the comfort, how much money they have, and the cost of gasoline. And we are now in a period, because the shale gas revolution, and the oil, rev shale oil revolution, the fact that we are producing from a ubiquitous resource called source rock, the long-run price of oil is probably going to be very close to 50 or 55 dollars. And it's right now 38.40 uh, for a barrel. Yeah, okay. it's about 48. 48, 48 dollars. Okay, <laughs> but uh, but two three years ago it was over 100. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and but you so, see, uh, but you see low oil going out. In yes, I am not worried about the long run price of oil. Okay. And that leads me to a lot of discussions about Hawaii's utility sector, which we can talk about another time. Right, because uh, as you know, we're paying about 32 cents per kilowatt hour. <laughs> yes, and that you are paying that because of your lots of reasons, including very high fixed costs for, because of an unusual view that uh, renewables can be quite cheap, but... Uh, you haven't solved the intermittency problem yet, which causes a lot of extra costs. Well, we're, we're unusual, I agree. Uh, we're like experiment because we're an island. Uh, we're not exactly. a part of a, a, you know, a series of grids on the mainland where you can buy you know, electricity or shift right. and so you forth. Not have dis yeah. The only dispatchable power you have is heavy, heavy fuel oil or oil. Right. Right. Uh, yeah, it's all imported. We burn it, and then that's how electricity right. is made. And it's even worse on the neighbor islands. Uh, if it's 32 cents here, it's about four, six cents higher on Maui, and that's even higher on Molokai, uh, even uh, uh, higher on Lanai. So we've had this discussion, and maybe we're getting off track. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I can talk to you about this in more detail okay. because. But coming back to think about Hawaii, this may not be the best place yeah. to put your climate but, dog. Okay, but so but coming going back to cars and and uh, so uh, you you put out uh, these factors in in consumer preference and and the market uh, yeah. for for cars, right? So and I, I agree with you because I recently I went to my dealer. I have a Prius, and I said you know uh, and and I want to trade it in. And then he says to me, my salesperson says, well, you know, uh, I can give you below Blue Book. And I said, but it's a Prius. It, it's, it's a, you know, I, I get a really good mileage. It's clean. It's a beautiful right. car. And he said that uh, uh, several years ago, he used to sell 40, 50 a month. Now he sells barely 15. Uh, because yeah. everybody, uh, for the same amount of money, they're buying, you know, SUVs and, and uh, larger cars. Because the price of gasoline is not right. so high. Right. Relatively. And there's another issue in this public policy debate. debate. Uh, two issues. One is, um, if, because consumer preferences are driving consumers to buy one kind of car, and the government regulatory framework is causing them to produce a different mix of fleet, right. the cost of the more gas guzzlers, if we, for a better term, the larger or bigger, newer... Right. Uh, cars, they become more expensive, hmm. and so the rate at which the fleet of the which, at which the fleet turns over, right. because yes, we might sell 17 million new cars in a year, but we have 250 million in the fleet now. Well, we'll come back to that point and explore this uh, question further after this short break for Think Tech Energy in America. Good afternoon, Howard Wig, Code Green, ThinkTechHawaii.com. I appear on Mondays at 3 o'clock 
and my gig is energy efficiency, doing more with less. It's the most cost effective way that we in Hawaii are going to achieve 100% clean energy by the year 2045. I look forward to being with you. Aloha. Thanks for watching Think Tech Hawaii and look forward to seeing you at Education Matters on Tuesdays with me, Carol Mon Lee. Hey everybody, it's me, Ian Davidson, host of a new show here at Think Tech called On The Go. What are you going to get during that show? I can't tell you. I can only tell you that it's going to be fun, and it's going to be sometimes, and I'm going to have a good time, and I hope that you do too. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff here at Think Tech. This is just another one. Take a chance on it. See how you like it. Thanks for watching. We're back on this uh, afternoon of Energy in America. We're talking via Skype uh, to our guest in Washington, D.C., who is uh, in the middle of um, all kinds of policy alignments and also keeps his uh, a tab, his, uh, his eye close to what's happening with consumers and cars and prices and so forth, uh, Lucian Bagliaresi. And uh, go ahead, Lucian. We were continuing uh, about... Um, couple of things, and uh, one you just said that uh, there's evidence that people drive more in uh, fuel-efficient cars. Yeah, yeah so, so there's two issues um, to think about, and that's why I think this midterm review, so if you read the press, you feel that the Trump administration has somehow removed the uh, regulatory program to reduce the uh, CAFE standards to 2025. In fact, that is not the case. They've just restored the original review process, which was supposed to take place okay. throughout 2017. So it's back and on track, that's what you're saying. Back you're, you're, on the, okay, the right. original track. Okay. So there are three or four issues that you need to think about. First, we need to talk about the health of the U.S. auto industry. U.S. auto industry, if you just take the production of automobiles and the dealerships, it's about a million people working, and it's about 3.5% of GNP. And even the National Academy talked, was concerned that if the technology uptake was not fast enough to meet the mileage standard, there would be something called stranded capital. Now, stranded capital is a buzzword for it's too costly, uh, you're producing a structure that's not really working. I mean, you, you, you've got my capital structure is not producing the cars people want to buy, and I have to lay people off. Okay. okay. That's so, so there's the health of the auto industry, and it's a legitimate concern, okay? It's something we should talk about. Second, uh, it's not just the new cars we have to think about, but the fleet. The United States probably has somewhere around 250, 270 cars and light-duty trucks in the fleet now. If the new cars become more expensive, the turnover of the fleet slows down. And if you think about something, what's more important, the efficiency of the new cars or the pace at which the fleet turns over and adopts more new cars? That, you have to think about that. And in, it's even more serious because it appears that to the extent that the CAFE standards raises the price of the gas guzzlers or the least fuel efficient cars that are new, those least efficient cars, that quartile actually, which has been studied carefully recently, people hang on to them, they become more valuable. Uh, and then third, third, a quick one, okay. is uh, if people buy, when people buy more efficient cars, they drive them more. That's called the rebound effect. So though all those right. factors should allow us to be a very reasoned and careful approach on how we set the standards. So given those, um, well, uh, ways in that uh, you're saying that the uptake uh, could be uh, affected by what you just said, those factors, yeah. um, uh, that the goal is to replace the gas guzzlers with more efficient cars in a, in a timely manner. Uh, uh, so given all that, and we know uh, certain factors are in play with the psychology of consumers and also with, with um, uh, with with uh, with money, you know uh, how to spend money uh, wisely, uh, efficiently. Uh, can the government or automakers get together to somehow uh, develop incentives to do the right yeah, thing? Yes. So I think actually I think this is the problem. Right now, the whole debate is highly polarized, 
And uh, so one of the things we ought to do is get all the uh, stakeholders together and see if we if some kind of kind of global arrangement can be made up. Right now, of course, you know, California has a special right. status right. and can get a waiver. But that waiver actually was based more on local pollution concerns because air quality conditions in California had historically been quite severe, L.A. Basin right. and, and other places. And that's a leader so, in, in, uh, in some uh, standards, right? I mean, uh, their, their standards become American standards after a while. Yeah, but, but the interesting thing now is that the big fight is not over local air pollution, but GHG or greenhouse gas emissions, right? And so here it's hard to argue that's a local problem. That's a global problem. And we know from the modeling of the IPCC and others that even if you eliminated all emissions of uh, greenhouse gases from the United States, it has no effect on predicted global temperatures or sea level rise, right? Well, we, US, well we have continuing uh, so the rise of, of cars in, in India and China in emerging yes, markets. <laughs> have, so, so the question is, should California be given a special waiver because somehow their leadership on this role will induce the Chinese and the Indians to behave differently? Maybe that's true, but that's the debate we ought to have. Right, right. Well, California does have, you know, I think a 45 million. It's a large population. Uh, it's a large course. population. Yeah, it is, it is quite large. And, it's, and, and, and the other interesting thing about California is that's where the uh, 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 most innovative designs for cars also take place. Am I correct? In no, LA, San Diego? I don't know. Well, yeah, of course, you're talking about the electric car. So you're talking, are you talking no, about... No, 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 no. All yeah. kinds of cars that uh, uh, California consumers... Uh, but I've seen uh, where I think Nissan, other uh, Ford, and others have have like uh, outposts for their R and D, looking at right. you know, That's uh, consumer uh, true. preferences. I think down in San Mateo, there's a Mercedes has a facility. Audi has a facility. You're absolutely right. There's several advanced research facilities in California for automobiles. And so, um, but going back, uh, Kevin, so you see this happening, um, uh, this midterm uh, review that should have happened is happening now. Right, uh, it's just being restored. Yes, yeah, so, exactly. so it's being restored to its rightful kind of pacing and so forth. Uh, so, so what do you think will happen? Uh, will there be more, uh, do you foresee, or your goal seems to be more of uh, people getting together and really discussing uh, how to, uh, you know, create the right incentives or, or direction. I, you know, I think all the players, if it were me, if I were king of the United States, I would say, look, the, the, in order, if you think about, think about the politics for a second, right, you might notice that there were a lot of upset voters in the industrial heartland of the United <laughs> that's States. That's correct, yes. They're, they're the and ones that put Trump over in those That's actually where they make the yeah. automobile. Right. So why don't we start there? and say, okay, is there a way we can sustain the health and the economic well-being of the employment and the uh, profitability of the automobile industry and all the parts manufacturers in the U.S., and at the same time, move along a gradient, right, which gets California and more, let's say, environmentally conscious parts of the country uh, satisfied that we're making enough progress and by the way making some modest tweaks to the standard might even allow the treat the fleet to turn over a bit quicker might allow us to other to do some other things maybe we should explore even god forbid an increase in the gasoline tax as an alternative strategy for some of this in other words we need to fund this corporate tax reform so i think if we can get both sides to be a little less polarized over this and think about the fact that there are a lot of stakeholders who have a lot, you know, are really concerned about that and are, in good faith are trying to do the right thing, uh, I, I suspect we can make some progress on this. But it's, you know, this is Washington, it's not easy. <laughs> but you're correct that uh, if you go back to the election, you're absolutely right that uh, a lot of the red. Uh, states or the so-called Rust Belt states or mm -hmm. states that had heavy manufacturing 
yeah. uh, saw uh, a very bleak future uh, for, for sure. themselves. And they saw a uh, Silicon Valley world where they were being uh, outpaced or, you know, uh, sure. uh, uh, kind of uh, put, uh, put place aside. And that feeling of alienation uh, came out that America does have a, a strong manufacturing base and, and, and automobiles is, is really a part of it. It has been historically. Right, and I don't think it's just, I mean, and of course, I'm not a person who believes it's all caused by unfair trade. This is automation, this is shifting consumer preferences, this is, uh, you know, inventory management. We, we just don't need as many people to produce the manufacturing, the manufactured goods that we used to. Right, right. No, it, it is a different world, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and of course, uh, but the other thing that uh, happened uh, in the early days of the administration was the appearance of Prime Minister uh, Abe to, to see Trump. And, and, uh, and of course, there has been a great investment in Smyrna, Tennessee, and Indiana, and, and Kentucky, and so forth, of uh, uh, Honda, and uh, in Ohio, and so forth, uh, uh, Nissan, and Toyota in the United States. Uh, do you see more of that happening? Uh, the Japanese plans? And I think a major initiative I expect to see from the Japanese, uh, including a personal initiative, Abe-san, is that he wants to see uh, exports of liquefied natural gas expand from the U.S. and for those supplies to move to the Pacific Rim, Rim, not just to Japan, but throughout other parts of the Pacific Rim in which Japan plans to take an active role with uh, incentives, technical assistance, and soft, soft money to try to encourage greater use of gas as a substitute for coal. So this is the interesting thing. And on one hand, you could argue that Trump is a very anti-climate person. On the other hand, if he succeeds in expanding the manufacturing base, gets more efficient automobiles, we expand natural gas, and that gas, as it is doing now in Mexico, replacing heavy fuel oil, and begins to replace coal, that can have a substantial improvement to the climate. And, and we're coming to the end with a substantial improvement in our program. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you very much, Lucian in D.C., for your time and comments.